In the previous video, we looked at Kant's criticism of the ontological argument. But we saw that according to Kant, there are three possible types of argument uh, that su are supposed to prove the existence of God. The ontological argument, which starts from concepts alone. The cosmological argument, which starts from the fact that something exists. Uh, and the physico-theological proof, which starts from well, all, all the actual stuff that we see around us, like the order and harmony and complexity and so on of nature. In essence, Kant believes that in criticizing the ontological proof, he has done the main thing because his argument is going to be that the other proofs actually depend on the ontological proof for their validity. Well, I mean, since the ontological proof isn't valid, it turns out that those other arguments aren't valid either. Uh, in fact, they're not really even sort of extra arguments, right? Everything in the end, according to Kant, depends on the ontological argument, which was already criticized. All right, so let us see what Kant does in section five on the impossibility of a cosmological proof of God's existence. Now, here is the argument. It is at the bottom of A604. If something exists, then an absolutely necessary being also has to exist. Now, I myself at least exist, therefore an absolutely necessary being exists. Kant's central criticism of this argument is not so much going to be that it is invalid, because there is a sense in which it, you know, in which it's okay for Kant, maybe even, uh, to believe that, yeah, I mean, we're, we're sort of forced into positing or believing that there's something that's absolutely necessary. But if this is all that we have, is th if this is the cosmological proof, and the end result is that an absolutely necessary being exists, well, that doesn't tell us much. It doesn't tell us which being is the absolutely necessary being. It leaves open, for instance, the possibility that I am the absolutely necessary being, or that this pencil is the absolutely necessary being, or that, you know, whatever is the absolutely necessary being. Now, what happens next? What happens next is that the person using the cosmological argument is going to identify the absolutely necessary being with the ens realissimum, with this highest being, uh, this sum total of all possibility that we met back in section two. But why would you be allowed to do that? Right? Why would you be allowed to claim that the highest being, this most sort of real being or this sum total of possibility is an absolutely necessary being, exists necessarily. Well, you can really only claim that if, you've, if you believe, if you have an argument that shows that from the very concept of the highest being, its necessary existence follows. In other words, if you have an ontological proof for the existence of God. So what Kant is claiming here is that the cosmological proof cannot possibly prove anything like the existence of God unless it is supplemented by the ontological proof. But if that's the case, then the cosmological proof is not an additional proof at all. It is merely another way of sort of sneakily getting into the ontological proof uh, without having the honesty of showing that that is what we are doing. So at the bottom of A606, Kant writes, in order to ground itself securely, this proof gets a footing in experience and thereby gives itself the reputation that it is distinct from the ontological proof, which puts its whole trust solely in pure concepts a priori. But the cosmological proof avails itself of this experience only to make a single step, namely to the existence of a necessary being in general. What this being might have in the way of properties, the empirical ground of proof cannot teach. Rather, he reason says farewell to it entirely and turns its inquiry back into mere concepts. Um, and then a little bit later, Kant concludes that uh, this is what the ontological proof asserted, which one thus assumes in the cosmological proof and takes as one's ground. So, um, according to Kant, the cosmological proof 
cannot possibly be an improvement over the ontological proof because it in fact requires it. And so again at the bottom of A610 he emphasizes this defect. The artifice of the cosmological proof is aimed merely at evading a proof of the existence of a necessary being a priori through mere concepts which would have to be carried out ontologically for which however we feel ourselves entirely incapable. In this respect, on the ground of an actual existence, we infer, as best we can, some absolutely necessary condition of that existence. Then we have no necessity of explaining the possibility of this condition, for if it has been proved that it exists, then the question of its possibility is quite unnecessary. So Kant claims that the cosmological proof is popular because it's, you know, by appealing to something that exists, like myself, and then saying, oh, there must be a necessary ground for this existence, it seems that we already have sort of the possibility uh, of this entity. And now if we identify it with God, then at least one difficult question can be evaded. But of course, if, if actually the ontological proof is presupposed, then nothing is evaded. So Kant adds to this section um, an unnumbered section called Discovery and Explanation of the Dialectical Illusion in All Transcendental Proofs of the Existence of a Necessary Being, which, you know, kind of sums up what, what goes on here. Um, he insists, this is at A616, that sort of the appeal to reason that is being made here has a legitimate use as a regulative principle. Right? The regulative principle which would be for everything given as existing to seek something that is necessary, that is never to stop anywhere except with an a priori completion, uh, com uh, sorry, never to stop anywhere except with an a priori complete explanation, but on the other side also never to hope for this completion, that is never to assume anything empirical as unconditioned. In such a significance, both principles can very well coexist with one another as merely heuristic and regulative. So again, what, what we find in reason are these regulative principles that tell us how to proceed in creating a unity among all our judgment, in extending our, our understanding of the world, um, in doing science really. That is what reason tells us to do, that is what reason gives us. But the, the problem that we, uh, the illusion that we fall into is we hypostasize these rules. That is, we posit as a really existing being the unity that the regulative principle asks us to seek. And that is what goes wrong in these transcendental proofs for the existence of God. A619 tells us that the ideal of the highest being is, according to these considerations, nothing other than a regulative principle of reason to regard all combination in the world as if it arose from an all-sufficient necessary cause, so as to ground on that cause the rule of a unity that is systematic and necessary according to universal laws. But it is not an assertion of an existence that is necessary in itself. So section six takes up uh, the third kind of proof, which is the physico-theological proof, which basically I think we generally know as the argument from design, right? Where we look at the world and we say, wow, this world is, you know, it, 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 it's made in such a way, it has that kind of structure, it must have been caused by an infinitely wise creator, right? Something like that, it must have been designed. Now, Kant starts out by pointing out that, that from the very beginning, this sounds very suspect, right? He says, this is A621, how can any experience be given that is supposed to be adequate to an idea? For what is special about an idea is just that no experience can ever be congruent to it, right? I mean, whatever amount of complexity and, and intricacy and harmony and, and wisdom maybe you find in the world, well, it's never gonna be infinite intricacy and wisdom and and all that kind of stuff so you're never going to be able to find an experience that sort of fits the infinite um the infinite sublimity of 
the posited world creator, right, of this of this posited God. And so there is necessarily something incongruent in anything like a physico-theological proof. How could you ever use this to prove the existence of God? Kant actually is kind of positive about the proof in the sense that he says, you know, this is it's it's so natural, it, it brings people to to sort of good religious thoughts, but we have to make sure that we don't think it's a philosophical proof of anything, right? Um, it can in no way, this is the bottom of A624, it can in no way harm the good cause to tone down the dogmatic language of a scornful sophist to the tone of moderation and modesty of a belief that is sufficient to comfort us, although not to command unconditional submission. Accordingly, I assert that a physico-theological proof can never establish the existence of a highest being alone, but must always leave it up to the ontological proof. So Kant, in, in order to argue that, or maybe he doesn't really need this in order to argue it, but he adds one, one further element uh, to show that, that whatever we see in nature, right, it can never bring us to the concept of God or the idea of God. Um, he says, well, you know, if I see some kind of order in nature, maybe, maybe I could infer to an architect, you know, who takes the matter of the world and orders it in a nice way. Um, how am I going to, to prove from any order in the world that, that the matter itself, that the world itself was created from nothing by this architect? Um, how do I show that it's not just an architect, but also a creator? That is like in principle impossible, right? So here we see another way in which we, we know in advance that the physico-theological proof, whatever it finds in experience, could never be enough to show um, that there must be a creator of the world that has certain properties like wisdom and, uh, and so on and so forth. So in fact, what happens, says Kant, is that, um, you know, at a certain point, the physico-theological proof, the, the person who brings this forward, is going to sort of sneak in the cosmological proof and say something like, well, you know, and since everything in this world is contingent, um, what must have created the world is, boom, okay, an absolutely necessary being. And then he's going to sneak in the ontological proof and say, oh, look, um, well, it's precisely the ens realissimum um, that, that is the only thing that can be sort of absolutely necessary. And so we find it again to the concept of God. That is Kant's uh, diagnosis of what happens here. The ideal ends with section seven, critique of all theology from speculative principles of reason, in which Kant doesn't tell us much new things, I would say. Um, he sort of puts forward a challenge saying that, oh, you know, if you really want to come up with more proofs of the existence of God, well, I will not refuse the challenge. This is at the beginning of A639. I will not refuse the challenge of discovering the fallacy in every such attempt of this kind and so frustrate its pretensions. Um, but, you know, I mean, why waste our time on this, right? We have seen from, from first principles that any proof for the existence of God is going to be impossible. Doesn't mean that we are supposed to not believe in God, right? And the very last words of the ideal proper, this is on A641, 641, is where Kant says, thus the highest being remains for the merely speculative use of reason, a mere, but nevertheless faultless ideal, a concept which concludes and crowns the whole of human cognition, whose objective reality cannot, of course, be proved on this path but also cannot be refuted. And if there should be a moral theology that can make good this lack, then transcendental theology, up to now only problematic, will prove to be indispensable through determining its concept and by ceaselessly censoring a reason that is deceived often enough by sensibility and does not always agree with its own ideas. Just like with freedom in the antinomy, here in the ideal, Kant says, okay, we can't prove freedom, we can't prove God, but on the other hand, we also know that we can't disprove freedom and we can't disprove God. 
So if there were some non-theoretical, some practical reason that would sort of push us into accepting, believing in freedom or believing in God, hmm, well, one thing that reason has accomplished, that theoretical reason has accomplished, is to leave open that space, to leave open that possibility, to ensure that no one can blame us for taking that practical step. And maybe what's more, we can, you know, free ourselves from certain wrong ways of conceiving God uh, through the kinds of reflections that we've been doing here in this particular part of the book. And so Kant thinks that actually, from a practical point of view, these ideals are going to be very important. We're, we're in a sense, going to have to have faith in freedom and God um, from a moral standpoint. Okay, that's not the business of the Critique of Pure Reason, of course. What is the business of the Critique of Pure Reason is to say a little bit more about how the ideals of reason function in um, theoretical cognition, in science, say. And that is what the appendix to the transcendental dialectic does, which we will look at in the next video.